pick up where we left off because at this point what we have what we learned is we know that muscle of course is going to be very unique that when we say muscle fiber that is going to be equal to a muscle cell so like if I were to take a peek at this muscle right there and if I were to peel it down to get a cell I would basically have this long fiber like this now what we talked about up to this point do you happen to um, recall what's going to actually be called the little units that are just one right after the other for the entire length of that fiber what that little unit is that can contract and relax our sarcomere all right do you remember what the the i guess like the lines the, the edges of the border are called mm -hmm. Our Z disc. Some of the stuff is called a line, like the M line, the line that's in the middle, that we're going to have this. Well, do you happen to remember what the protein filaments are that are going to do this sliding action? My maxin and my myosin. And we're going to have the ability for it to do, do you guys remember that sliding filament theory? Okay. Where they're going to, you know, going to have this little big piece of the myosin acting around it. Actin has that troponin tropomyosin complex. What ion is needed from that sarcoplasmic reticulum for this process to occur, to begin to take place? my calcium okay so calcium has to attach to that troponin tropomyosin complex make it shift so that the active sites on that actin are available and then the myosin heads can attach and pull so that is pretty much the point that we left off last week we were talking about the sarcomeres and we had looked at their structure we had looked at the ions that are present and hopefully we had identified that when we say a muscle fiber we're also understanding that that is also a muscle cell so there was there's something that's kind of unique about the muscle cell do you guys remember that it's multi-nucleated? Because it is such a huge, or it can be, I should say. It can be such a huge cell. So, at this point in time, now that we've looked at the structure, and we're understanding that we have from Z-disc to Z-disc, we now have to understand those events that are going to take place that make a muscle contract. Now, what was it, if we look at the muscle as a whole, what penetrated through that epimysium, that outer connective tissue layer, okay? That's, that's what we've got. So, we've got a blood supply and we've got a nerve supply. What happens or, or what does that nerve do once it enters through that outer connective tissue layer? We're going to see the branching that's going to take place and connect to every fiber. Now what that is telling me is that every cell is going to have a nerve that meets it. A 
and I think our representative did it last week on the board when we drew the muscle cell that kind of represented the nerve. All right. Do you happen to remember what this is called, this area as a whole? What? No, I think I think I heard you right. It's the area for the synapse where we're going to get the release of the neurotransmitter. And because this is an area where a nerve, neuro, meets a muscle cell, this is going to be called a neuromuscular junction. Okay, an NMJ. We had the release of those neurotransmitters. What kind of proteins were found just right here? Which which kind of the ligand gated? ones that are for a receptor. So if I've got the ligand gated, okay, which ones were found along the rest of the area of that muscle cell? My, you said? Voltage. Voltage gated, okay? Now, because we're using that term gated, what is that kind of telling me take something taking place? What's taking place? All right, I'm going to see my ions. Do you know which one's going to be a huge one? My sodium, okay? But gated. Which one's going to use energy? I do have one that uses energy. Do you happen to know which one it is? Do you remember the sodium potassium pump? Because that's the one that allows those ions to come back into balance. Okay? Now, voltage gated, they have the gate, they're in response to something. Okay, and when they open, in this case, it's going to allow for the movement of a lot of my sodium. Now, here's the thing. What we see happening in this muscle cell is going to be very similar to what happened with the nerve. The muscle the skeletal muscle, okay? The skeletal muscle is not going to move without information from the nerves, okay? Now let me repeat that. The skeletal muscle is not going to contract without the impulse from the spinal nerves, okay? So that tells me that there has to be a transmission of the nerve impulse. I use the example of how we use our higher order thinking to get us ready to get up out of the chair at the 3.15 break time. That is actually starting an impulse. Because we're thinking about it, the muscles are receiving signals that are going to make them ready to act when you get up. So, I'm going to have this movement of that nerve transmission. When that takes place, you happen to remember the neurotransmitter that gets released. My acetylcholine, everything that 
this point that we're seeing take place, everything is electric. It has electricity because it's operating from ions. Does that make sense? So, our movement, the physiology of the skeletal muscle, our nervous system is controlling these contractions. It is in when we do something, okay, whether we're picking up a pencil or a pen to write on the paper, whether we're walking across the floor, whether we're picking something up, we are doing these in response to something from the nervous system. Now, note, I'm trying to stress that this is the control of our skeletal muscle. What other two types exist? Smooth, cardiac. All right? When this takes place, because we're dealing with electricity, it's an action potential. It has the potential to perform an action. Is that not correct? If we're thinking about my skeletal muscle, and if I'm walking across the floor, I have to think about the fact that I'm going to walk across the floor, which was a higher order brain function, which is going to affect some of the other neurons in my brain, which is going to send transmissions to some of the areas of my brain, eventually leading to the neurons in my spinal cord, where I'm going to find my spinal nerve. The spinal nerves are the ones that exit. These are the nerves that after I've done my thinking here, impulses travel down here, that impulse exits. These come around, go down, come around, go down. These are coming to meet my muscles. And when they meet the muscle, they branch to a fiber. I have now created an action potential. Yes, ma'am. We have our apples and our axes from the unit. Okay? Now, we mentioned that this can be tested, that we can measure this. We have, do you guys know that little, um, because we said the heart, I know it as EKG, you guys know it as ECG. Okay? I mentioned that myogram that we can test for the muscle. Okay? Brain, we can test like an EEG. Okay? So this means it can be measured. Now, because it can be measured, what we know about muscle contraction is muscle contraction, well, every, almost every cell of our body is going to have the ability to be at rest. However, with muscle cells, nerve cells, okay, they need to be ready to act. Meaning, as you look at their membrane, and for the most part, the inside portion of that membrane is negative. A lot of the stuff on the outside is positive in the form of the sodium ions, okay? So when this muscle is not in motion, 